Testing, testing. Ah. or welcome back as the case may be. I'm Christine E. Schultz, aka the Elvish author, and of course, the wonderful, the fantabulous Isaac. Isaac, or Isaacry, as we sometimes call him. Just you. And today It is really. I like it. <laughs> today we are doing a special book video. Mm. He doesn't even know what we're doing. Uh, he has no no idea. He doesn't know things. Not be Puka. <laughs> that will come. Maybe next week actually. Mm. Uh, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself emotionally. But no, today we're doing something else. I have to reach it, guys. Hang on. So, I would like you... I don't know what's going on. ...to open this here Amazon box. It's very heavy. Open it. Show them. It's your book! Well, <laughs> I mean, nobody's surprised that it's my book, but which one is it? It's, it's your question. new Narwhals and the Stars. She's yes. been working on <laughs> we showed them the cover. Show so it off. Pretty. Show it off. Show it off. Up and close and personal. We got some narwhals. We got some people riding on the narwhals. We got some fancy words. Yep, that's it. We should uh, open up the beginning. The other beginning. No, no, you're right. I <laughs> keep going. You get a book? Oh no! Oh. Hi. I love you. Would you like to read what it says? I can't right now. Alright, well, poor Nish, he now has a book dedicated to him. Uh, also, we both love narwhals. It's kind of our thing. If you haven't, if you haven't noticed, we have this narwhal. And we have a this narwhal. And you have, you have to have narwhals because I don't have all of them in my in my lap. And you have this narwhal, and we have this narwhal, and we have this really this really creepy guy who's not a narwhal, but we love him anyway. He lives here now, so. And oh, there's Fluffy, where's Fluffy Wall? Fluffy Wall, and Fluffy Wall. We have many narwhals, so. Anyway. You make me cry on camera. <laughs> are we gonna? Are we gonna? <laughs> Are we gonna do this book? Yeah. Yeah, we're not gonna read the whole thing. Of course, we're gonna read the blurb, you guys, in the first chapter so we can see what this book is all about, jumping right into it. Uh, yeah, so recently published, it's on Amazon in paperback and ebook form it's also on barnes and noble and some other websites in ebook form so if you guys are interested in this book after we take a look at it i will leave some links down below so this one follows the same characters as larmar gem of the sea that being said both books are in my amelian legends collection which means that you don't have to read any book to read any of the others they're all standalone books However, these two books are the only two where you follow the same characters. The other books are all different characters from different, you know, kingdoms from within my same world. So, but even though these do contain the same characters, they can be read separately. But it's kind of nice to be able to read both at some point and just see how the characters met and, you know, how their journey progresses and everything. But again, they are separate stories. So if you want to try one versus the other first, no problem. Really no problem. So, as those always. covers are fire. The covers are fire. I wish that you guys could see even better on film. There's, there's natural light in here right now, so it actually looks pretty good. Um, but the same artist did, you know, Larmar's cover as well. Of course I rehired her because she is fire, as he says. Uh, so, yeah. So we're going to read the blurb to you guys. <clears throat> and uh, then we'll read the first chapter. Let's do it. And see what it's about. So strap on your elf ears and listen up as we get ready to read from Narwhals in the Stars. All right, the blurb to Narwhals in the Stars by myself says, Flying narwhals, deadly snowstorms, and daring escapes from racist enemies. What could possibly go wrong? Captain Jor embarks on another epic quest with his best friend, Larmar, princess of the underwater city that shares her namesake. Their mission this time? To follow the legends of the Starwhals, flying narwhals who live in the heavens and grant wishes, to discover if they're true. As usual, Jorah finds more than he bargained for when he learns of a dark curse, the cure for which hinges upon their proving whether the Starwalls are real. 
What's more, as they delve farther north, a strange magical frostbite consumes Larimar's body, threatening her life. Meanwhile, a nameless young woman and boy flee into the same snowstorm, hoping to escape the cruel clutches of racism, slavery, and abuse. While sheltering in the camp of the Takima tribe, the very people her husband despises, the woman comes to accept them as the family she never had and always desired. However, the stakes mount when old enemies attack, seeking to annihilate everything she's come to love. As the woman's story unfolds and collides with Jor and Larmar's, one thing becomes clear. To help all their plights, they must pray that the legends of the Star Walls are much more than mere legend. Are the Star Walls real? If so, can the new companions brave the utter north to find them before the Takim are destroyed and Larmar turns to ice from the inside out? Can Jor help save Larmar's life a third time? Or has he finally met his match with this perilous adventure? So many questions. So many questions. So many questions. Mm -hmm. Star Walls. And hmm, I'm going to read them the dedication, and then you can cry again. Hmm. It says, For my Isaac, the Jora to my Larimar, king of the narwhals and of my heart. It's very sweet and very true. So, you know, anyway. Okay. Uh, we have um, the map, as we do, out with all of my books that are in this realm, which is the Lizolian realm. Well, it says map of the four realms. So you do. You have the, the seven kingdoms, the Lizolian realm. And then the Eastern and Western realms are pretty mysterious in either direction. Um, but any of my stories that are set in this world has this map. So that's kind of nice. You guys can kind of see better if you buy the book. But you can, guys can kind of see. Uh, and we are going to be starting off in the Seaside Kingdom of Muriel. So, uh, which if any of you have read Larimar, Gem of the Sea, you know that that is Jorah's kingdom. So... This one is divided into parts, three parts, and the first part is called Snow. I believe we have, man, I have to remember my own book. It's been a while since I looked at this because you're right, I've been working on it for a while. Uh, but I believe it's Snow. What's the second one? Guys, now I have to figure out. Patient, patience for just one second here. That's what it is. I need the third one. So it's Snow and Silver and then Star, I believe, are the three parts. So we're going to start with part one. And just read a chapter to give you guys kind of a taste for what the book is like, what the style is like, and all that good stuff. Chapter 1. Ha ha! Catch me if you can, Caracol! Captain Joris tousled sandy brown hair, whipped behind him as he and Caracol, his best shipmate, zoomed along the sandy shoreline. The two men raced across the beach by balancing on small, curved sleds made of wood and pearl. Reins connected each sled to the beast pulling them. A sand wall. A creature like a small whale, but with thick, coarse fur that protected it from both sand and sun, and with a great long horn spiraling from its head, much like that of a unicorn. The sand walls were akin to the narwhals found in the ocean off the coast of Muriel, Jorah's kingdom. Of course, while narwhals favored the water, sand walls preferred to glide across the sands of beaches and deserts, burrowing deep beneath them to create their homes. Jorah released a loud, and, in Caracol's opinion, rather overdramatic, Whoop! And cracked his reins, pulling ahead across the sandy drifts that sprayed up in either direction like golden waves. The ocean shimmered like millions of sapphires, diamonds, and tourmalines in the brilliant blaze of the setting sun. It truly really was a glorious sight to behold. After so many crazy, hair-brained adventures, Caracol had found the reprieve at Jorah's castle in Muriel more than refreshing. Except for these confounded races and other wild sports Jorah insisted upon. Jorah swerved his sand wall closer to the ocean, Splashing through the shallows with a triumphant laugh as Caracol ate sand and water right behind him. Caracol skidded to the side, sputtering sand and cursing quietly before urging his sand wall forward again. Captain or no captain, king or no king, Caracol would not let Jorah win that easily. He never did. Jorah wasn't one to appreciate an easy victory, after all. The two men approached a large drift of sand. Jorah urged his sand wall to go faster, and Caracol followed suit. As the mountain of sand loomed near, stretching its shadow over them, Caracol braced himself. The sand wall started to leap up the hill, only to burrow straight inside the sand, bursting through the hill to the other side. Caracol closed his eyes as the sprays of white and gold blinded him. Beyond the drifts, Jorah tumbled from his sled. Caracol slid past with a victorious cheer before his sand wall veered to the side, making his legs twist underneath him. Caracol went flying, landing just a few feet from Jorah. The two sand walls halted in the ocean shallows. 
calling toward the waves in their musical language. As two narwhals poked their heads above the subtle waves to greet them, Karakor released a heavy sigh. <sighs> of course, he groaned, half feigning annoyance. We would race during the height of mating season. He glanced over at Jor with a grin. Does this still mean I won, though? Seeing as how I lasted longer than you. The terms of the race were to reach the two palm trees, not merely to outlast me, Jora said, his green eyes granting Karakul a fierce stare. Karakul glared back, and, as usual, the young king couldn't keep a straight face for long. Bursting into a hearty laugh, Jora collapsed back into the sand. What a show, Karakul! I always appreciate racing with you. You're one of few and afraid to grant me a true challenge, now I'm king. I, Karakul said with a grin, you are both my captain and king. But above all, you remain my friend, and a bit like my rascally little brother, if I may make so bold. You may. And if I may make so bold. Jorah spread his arms wide in the sand and turned his face to the sky. I do believe that it may be time, Karakul. Karakul turned his face to the heavens as well. Stars began to peep between the shifting clouds as the sun dipped further, darkening the sky to a deep midnight blue. Karakul glanced at his captain and felt his heart lurch with the gleam in his eye. Excited, almost crazed, if anyone asked him. He had seen that look far too many times before to deny its meaning. Just what kind of cockamamie shenanigans were they about to embark upon this time? Have you ever heard, Karakul, Dora asked with breathless excitement, the legends of the Star Walls? Karakul inhaled deeply and turned back to the stars. Here we go again, he thought. Captain Jorah was always chasing after the craziest legends, myths, rumors. The trouble was, these hardly ever turned out to be any of those things. At least nine and three quarters times out of ten, the stories Jorah pursued turned out to be very real indeed, and often more dangerous than the, than the legends foretold. Between almost being eaten by mermaids, swallowed by cursed sea storms, attacked by vengeful sea serpents, and so forth, Karakul didn't know any crews besides Jorah's who had faced death so many times and lived to tell each tale. After all these years, Karakul wasn't sure if it was fate, ingenuity, or sheer dumb luck that kept them all going. No, Captain, Karakul said at last. I suppose I can't say as though I have. Star walls are a special breed of narwhal, just like our sand walls or the snow walls who dwell in the snowy peaks of the Erebusian mountains. Legends in Erebus also speak of star walls, narwhals that can fly, that swim through the clouds and stars, high up in the heavens where they make their home. Strange, isn't it, Captain, Karakul said, that such legends hail from Erebus? What do the cloud folk say? You would think that if such creatures exist, the floating city would be most likely to catch sight of them. The Abolinos claim to see a star wall here and there when the unicorns take their, make their migration. But such sightings are not concrete. They could simply be mistaking one of the unicorns for a star wall. Leastways, it's unknown from where exactly the star walls might hail. Other than the sky, of course. But in Erebus, known for its showers of shooting stars, when the stars rain down, it's said that gems also fall to the snow. Snow diamonds, the Erebusians call them. These gems are so precious, they often give them as tokens of love. Other of the Seven Kingdoms have claimed to find such gems as well, though sadly, I've never heard of any findings in Muriel. But Erebus, Didapolis, even in Niglio, their legends claim that the star walls are the craftsmen of such gems. And I'm going to find out if these legends are true. Karakul pondered for a few moments. Other than the idea of flying, or heights in general for his part, such a mission sounded less perilous than their usual endeavors, if no less ludicrous. Might it not be possible just to go to Erebus and watch one of their star showers for yourself? Of course it would be possible, but entirely outside the point. The star showers are random, few and far between. And besides, I would see with my own eyes the star walls of the heavens. So we're off from Uriel then to explore the other kingdoms, Karakul asked, genuinely begrudging the idea of leaving his lavish, warm, serene bedchamber. He knew he couldn't call the castle home forever, but he had been hoping for more than a week's stay after their recent near-death incident in China. Jor shook his head. Not quite yet. There is one person I need to see who is something of an expert on narwhals, and whose own legends might just lead us to the Star Walls. Someone I've been anxiously awaiting to share another adventure with, as it's been far, far too long. Ocean foam sprayed Jorah's face as the wind filled his ship's sails, giving the beloved vessel a mighty push forward. He inhaled deeply, relishing the balm of salty air cleansing his lungs. 
Since officially taking the crown of Muriel, Jorah hadn't been able to embrace his passion for exploration quite as much as he would wish. Of course, leading and protecting his kingdom had proven to be its own type of adventure, one he had readily tackled and come to love. But he thrilled to be reunited with his ocean, his first love. And after all, this time, the quest was very personal and close to his heart. Out of habit, Jorah glanced at his compass and then turned his sights toward the ocean once more. He had traveled this way so often in the past couple of years that he could now sense when they reached the coordinates, as though they had been mapped into his heart, just as the song inside the seashell dangling over his heart had been engraved inside his memory. Slipping the compass into his pocket, he lifted the shell to his ear. The song of the Larimar people echoed clearly now. This was it. Slow the ship, Jora commanded. Drop anchor and wait for me. I'm going in. Before Caracol finished his obligatory protest of concern for his safety, Jorah leapt off the side of the ship and dove beneath the blue-green waters. No matter how many times they made this visit, Jorah knew Caracol's nerves were on edge until he returned. Jorah supposed he couldn't blame him. The first time they had made this voyage, Jorah was almost eaten alive by a mad sea serpent. Quite opposite of Caracol's reaction, Jorah feared this place the least of any place and felt his excitement overflow anew with each visit. He allowed himself to sink several yards into the pleasantly warm waters. They maintained this constant temperature by the magic of Eula, Queen of Laramar, and then began swimming forward, lured on by the seashell's song, more vividly audible the deeper he dived. The same seashell allowed him to breathe underwater, just like the Laramar people who had granted him that gift. The shell's melody chorused clearer, leading him through the ocean's depths until two great cliffs stood silhouetted against the blue-green waters, their outline illuminated by the dozens upon dozens of brilliant blue stones shining all along their ridges. Swimming between the cliffs, Jorah stared in wonder. A couple of months had passed since his last visit, and it seemed that even more Larmar stones had appeared since then. Said to literally grow from the cliffs surrounding the Larmar people's home, the Larmar stones held mysterious powers. As he emerged from the cliff passage to the open waters beyond, Jorah's wonder intensified as the great glowing blue kingdom of Larmar spanned before him. The underwater city's many buildings crafted from light-colored stone and coral stretched high. Many towers and turrets were overlaid with gold, pearl, or the brilliant blue Larmar stones. Rising above the city, the castle stood as the tallest, grandest structure, its pure Larmar and pearls shining like a beacon for lost travelers at sea. Larmar stones glowed all along the cliffs, which surrounded the city in a protective ring. People swam in and out of passages like the one Jor emerged from. They possessed cinnamon-colored skin, and silver streaks in their long ebony hair glowed like stardust. Bits of Larmar stones, pearls, and gems adorned their flowing robes and trousers, woven in vibrant blues and corals. Jorah hovered in the water for some moments. While he was a man who liked to be on the move, this place was different for him. No matter how many times he visited, he couldn't help but pause as awe and warmth flowed through him. Visiting Larmar felt like coming home. As a couple swam past, Waving and greeting him by his name, he snapped from his reverie, returned the gesture, and swam forward into the city's markets. People of all ages moved to and fro, gliding gracefully through the streets. Others walked along the ocean floor, weaving through the market stalls, trading shells, coral, and pearls for clothing and fish and treasures from other lands like books, furs, and spices. Jorah had been astonished the first time he had explored the markets at how each item remained perfectly unharmed by the water. Even books and parchment felt completely dry, preserved by magic. As Jorah wound through the city toward the palace, greeting familiar faces in passing, his astonishment swelled inside his heart. This was by far not the first trip he had made since his encounter with the serpent that had once held the Larmar people in its terrible clutches. And yet, he couldn't help but continue to marvel at the contrast between how the city was now and how it had appeared that first time before he had helped fell the foul beast. Then, the deserted city had glowed with a pale, ghostly beauty. Now, the sight of so much vibrant life bursting from the city overwhelmed and inspired. Even the Larimar stones shone brighter to him, as if the Larimar people truly were the lifeblood of the city, as if the city had needed their restored presence to thrive and reveal its true beauty. At last, the palace rose before him, its Larimar gleaming blue, setting its mother of pearl shimmering with all manner of rainbow hues. Guards clad in gold and pearl armor hovered in the waters surrounding the palace on all sides. A few nodded at Jorah as he swam past, but most paid him little heed. He swam straight to the familiar tower and peeked inside the open window. There, at her desk, sat his dearest friend, Princess Larimar, who shared the namesake of her shining city and noble people, carefully examining several trinkets through a magnifying glass. 
Her hair flowed around her, alternating ebony and silver. A brilliant blue and aqua dress flowed from her lithe, curvy frame. You look as involved in your work as I often do in my studies of ancient legends. I dare say Meryl will give us both a proper scolding for wasting our time with such frivolities. Lorimar remained bent over her work for a few moments longer. Then, shoulders straightened with recognition, her head popped up and she whirled toward him, silver blue eyes gleaming. It's about time you came to see me again, she said, pretending to scold him. But in the next moment, she had surged through the waters, grabbing him in a joyous embrace. Jorah held her close and laughed out loud. You've gotten my letters at least, I hope. Of course. She pulled back from the hug and motioned to the mother of pearl chest where she stored them. A thrill at his heart every time she reminded him that she kept them as treasures. But reading about your adventures in China and wondering if you're going to do something stupid to anger one of the emperors again isn't nearly the same as seeing you before me, safe and presumably in one piece, getting to touch you. She threw her arms around him once more and they twirled through the water holding each other close and laughing as Jorah vainly tried to mesh his clumsy movements with her graceful ones. Ah, it's so good to see you, Lari, Jorah cried. Have you been up to any adventures of your own? In a way. Larmar took his hand and dragged him over to her desk where various stones and corals gleamed with many vibrant colors. Soft cloths and sea sponges showed that she had been cleaning and polishing them. I've been researching underwater gems and corals, Larmar said. I have this book that was a favorite of mine growing up. I'd like to find one of each stone and coral inside the book, if I can. Well, look at you. You've become a proper explorer yourself in my absence. If you keep this up, you'll be giving me a run for my money. Lorimar laughed. It's more of a surprise I'm putting together for Eula, really. Besides, I doubt that the high kings and queens and other lords that send you on your missions would be, would be brought out by bits of coral and underground stones. Jorah snorted. You'd be surprised what men will fight over. Pretty stones not being the least. Many pay whole fortunes for such treasures. And they are treasures indeed. But you know what treasure doesn't cost a single copper coin? Dangerous quest of daring in search of legends that might just cost you your life instead? Lormar arched a brow and tilted her head with a playful smirk. Well played, Jor admitted, and exactly correct. Lormar circled Jor and then wrapped her arms around him from behind. Resting her chair on his shoulder, she asked, And what crazy legend might you be chasing after this time? Mind what you call crazy, Jorah pretended to scold, seeing as it's one of those legends that led me back to you. He grabbed one of her hands and whipped her around. She laughed as he spun her into his arms. It was his turn to hug her close from behind, chin resting on her shoulder. Be that as it may, it was still crazy, Lor Larmar insisted, sailing into a storm to discover some underwater city that may or may not even exist. And how glad I am that it did exist. Likewise, but what's all this about? You're up to something. I know it. You have that look about you. I have a look. She twirled away artfully, breaking from his hug, but still holding his hands, now facing him. You do when you're itching to get at a new adventure. It's that look of anticipation, of intention, of readiness. Honestly, when you went chasing after those tree people a few months back, you should have seen your face. You look like a madman. It does feel a bit that way, I suppose. I get these ideas, and they grow inside me until I must feed them. A bit like an addiction, though a safe one. Lamar granted him a skeptical roll of her eyes before smiling gently. I prefer to think of it as you pursuing your passions, like a frenzied artist. The art simply has to come out of you to be given breath and life. Or the exploration, in your case. Proper exploration is an art, my good lady. Of course. And what artistic endeavors have snared your interest this time? Have you ever heard of Star Walls? Larmar's brow knit in what might have looked like confusion to anyone else. But Jorah had come to recognize such a look as one of intense thought, of her diving into some hidden memory bank. They sound vaguely familiar. I know of sand walls and narwhals, of course. And I've heard of snow walls, too. But Star Walls? If I've ever heard such a tale, its memory is buried too deeply for me to reach it. Well, legends from Erebus and other kingdoms say that star walls are cousins to narwhals, sandwalls, and snow walls alike. Of course, I've gathered just enough information in my recent studies to give me hope that star walls are just as real as the rest. They're said to hail from the north, dwelling high above in the very stars. Oh yes, Larmar cried. I remember now. It was a story Eula used to tell me as a child. A bedtime tale, one of many she had learned from a man who collected such tales from the Seven Kingdoms. I was hoping you might know more that the Larmar people might have legends or knowledge of their own, concerning their bond with the narwhals. I wish we did too. Wishes! 
I do remember the story saying the Star Wars could grant wishes. I'm afraid that's all I do remember. However, her face pulled into another frown as she dove once more into the recesses of her memories. You know, if the legend truly exists in the Seven Kingdoms history, there is one place you may find out more about it. In the Niglio, in their famed Hall of Stories. Of course, Jorah cried, slapping his palm against his forehead. Why didn't I think of it? You're a genius, Laurie, an absolute wonder, as ever. Come with me. Larmar's brows rose. You want me to join you on one of your adventures? A grin illuminated Jorah's face and sparked in his green eyes. Why not? It's been far too long. Adventure with me, as we once did. You would be nice, don't you think? To share in a journey where nothing is trying to eat or kill or otherwise maim us? He arched a brow and offered his hand. Larmar laughed and slipped her hand in his. It would indeed. Lead on, brave captain, to the kingdom of Aniclio. And that is the end of chapter one of Narwhals in the Stars. Thoughts, comments, questions? Amen. First book was one of the first books I read of yours. True, true. Why I learned. But I think I like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any more specific thoughts yet? or? No, I like this. adventure. I like these two characters. I'm excited to find out. And you like Star Wars. Stars, really. Yeah, so we got questions. <laughs> Are the Star Walls real? Uh, we know from the blurb there's going to be some other things going on. The, one thing that's cool about this book is, you know, it's divided into three parts. So part one is kind of, you know, Jorah and Larmar starting this adventure. Part two is when we skip over to some completely different characters, but their story, and, and then that's completely their story. But then part three, the two stories collide, and those two groups of characters collide, which is pretty a pretty neat setup, I think, and... I'm not just saying that because I wrote it. Thing. I just think it's, yeah, I think mm -hmm. I really enjoy how I was inspired to do that and how that came a, came into being. Um, so yeah, again, if you guys are interested in reading this book for yourself, whether as an ebook or whether as a paperback, you can find both on Amazon. Again, there are some different ebook formats available on sites like Barnes. I almost said Barnes Words. That's not, that's not anything. Barnes and Noble or Smashwords is what I meant to say. Um... Yeah, so those are also some options if you want a different ebook format. Uh, yeah, and I don't think there's really been anything else to really say. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, go go read the book, guys. It's it's a good book. Oh, that's the other thing too for Larimar, which is the first story containing these characters. Uh, this one's also available as a paperback or ebook. But as you can see, it's quite a small book. It's only about. It's really a very, very short novella. It's only about 50 pages. I went ahead and made a paperback because I like to have a paperback of everything. Some people prefer paperback. I prefer paperback. So even if it's like a really small, small, small thing like this, I will do a paperback of it. But the point is, is that this one is available as a free download ebook wise on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and you know, pretty much a lot of places where you could find ebooks. So if you want to check out this story for free or just check out my writing for free, that's a really good sample that doesn't cost you anything. And then if you like it, you could go on to read Narwhals and some of my other books. Yes? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, I think that's all for now. On that note, happy reading. May you be inspired. And we'll see you in our next video. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.